Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. The Mahmaya people are one of the 18 tribes of uh, Orang Asli living in West Malaysia and most of them reside in Pulau Keri in Selangor. Already among the most marginalized communities in Malaysia, they're also at risk of displacement and eviction due to rapid coastal development. Now, to better understand the challenges that they face, let's speak to our first guest tonight, Kamal Sohalmi Fazil. He is from the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at University Malaya. Kamal, uh, good evening. Can you begin maybe our conversation by helping us understand who the Mahmeri people are? I mean, I mean, just beyond the kind of official statistics and that, you know, the blurb that you see sometimes on websites, <laughs> really understand, you know, who they are, um, a bit more about the settlements, their livelihoods, and their lived realities. Okay, uh, so so the Ma Mary, uh, <laughs> uh, an Oransli, one one of the Oransli, eighteen Oransli group, as you mentioned. Sometimes we, we also think of a of a nineteenth. Huh? There's also the Tamok, but oh. they they're basically a, a group, um, an Oransli group that falls under the Senoi, the larger sub sub group of the Senoi, and they uh, occupy an area around Slango, stretching from um the the um what's that uh stretching from Sepang to Kerry Island down to Klang. Um mm. so you know you find a large population nowadays in Kerry Island and if I'm not mistaken also in Bukit Bangkong. So you've got about four thousand odd uh population. Traditionally they were a fishing community uh that lived along the coast and also the the uh River Rhine if I'm not mistaken where they exploited mangrove um, ecology and and the sea, they will go out and fish, and they would also collect shells and crabs from the coastal areas. Right. Um, so, because they live by the coast, Kamal, um, you know, there, there's a lot. Coastal areas are often um, very uh, at risk of not just uh, changes to the coastline and to climate change and to pollution, but also. Um, to the risk of one overdevelopment, or development for tourism, for economic gain. Um, yeah. So they're they're living at an in an area where property developers might consider prime location, right? That's true. Also, estates, uh, as in Kerry Island, they are they are part of uh, you know they they are living now surrounded by oil palm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, and in 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 the Sepang area, of course, there's there's this whole uh, eco eco tourism uh, based on on uh, development of the coastal areas. Right. So, um, talk to us a little bit about the risk that they face. Um, there are already, you know, Orangasli communities are already sometimes um, forgotten in uh, policy response and interventions, and I'm just wondering whether um, they face further risk of mm -hmm. where they live because they live uh, in areas such as coastal areas. Yeah. Um, so, what are the, some uh, of the vulnerabilities they face? Okay, so so uh, I'm more familiar with communities in the interior, such as Upper Pera, you know, in Belom, and I've done right. some work in Pahang with the Jakun community. Uh, uh, so maybe we'll generalize this a bit more, if that's sure. okay. Uh, but they, so they, they, so many of the Oransis today live in areas that, in one way or another, have resources, uh, or are attractive to to development, either for the natural resource they have, or because of the features that that they you know the, the features that exist in the area they live on. Um, one of the problems that Oransi faces as a consequence of not having the kind of recognition from the state that this is customary land. Uh, often means that they are, you know, quote unquote, evicted as squatters. Uh, so they're treated as squatters on the land and often uh, asked to move for the land to be developed. The consequence of which is then other people benefit from the from the from the value of that land or resource, while they now marginalize, either slide further into poverty, or remain poor. Right. If they are uh, not, uh, sorry, if they're not relocated to an area where resources are rich for them to exploit, like other coastal areas, mangrove areas, if they happen to be re relocated inland, 
then they then that skill set is not with them and so they they become impoverished further if especially the environment is impoverished can can you talk about relocation because you know it's not as easy as it sounds it's not about packing up and going somewhere else this is uh, about you know um, l- your livelihood your tradition your culture um it's not like we you know you think about in an urban setting you pack up and move if yeah. you want to sell your property or you want to leave that property how how is it in the context of of orang asli Alright, so so I I guess it goes back it it it, it goes uh yeah perhaps and a step back from that would be to think about how they look at land. So um when we talk about customary land uh for the orang asli, oftentimes it's more than simply an economic resource, uh mm. or a shelter. It's oftentimes that it it's also something bigger. It's also um it's also a space. That where it's also a uh, it's also a space where they have cultural attachment, r- religious attachments. Um, a lot of cultural attachments here can also include knowledge that they have that has allowed their community to survive for you know hundreds if not thousands of years in the landscape. They've learned to exploit the landscape sustainably because they've lived there for a long time, uh, and it's and it is bounded. A lot of times, the misconception about orang asli land is that it's as as far as the eyes can see, you know, or as far as as you can roam, you know. There's But there's no boundary, right? There's, there's no, no boundary. like clear land boundary. It's uh, right. I can see landmarks and yeah, and it's but, yes. But that's not true. They do have. It is a bounded territory. It is a large territory. Almost, almost think of it almost like a state. It's in some places like in. In Ulu Perak and all the uh, the Jahai might call it Negeri. You know? It's almost like a state. It it and within this landscape they move around, but within their bounded landscape, it might be it might be the boundaries might be marked by a river valley. It might be marked by you know uh, where the source comes from in the mountains, um, by uh, features that that exist in the landscape, but. Uh, on top of that, there will be stories that they have of the landscape that signifies to them when they see this landscape. Right, this is where my ancestor disappeared, or this is where this place has sacred significance. So somebody died here and became a spirit, you know, uh, or uh, there is there is a, a like for other groups, not necessarily the Ma Mary, other communities. There might be a, a a spiritual being that lives in this particular hill. And and these are their spirits, and so they would understand the landscape, the spirits, and they would learn their healing songs from these spirits. Where they go then and perform to the healing songs, we call sewang, to to celebrate, you know, the spirits that exist in their landscape. Right. They don't do it in somebody else's landscape. And when they and in some people that I've spoken to in other areas, when we talk about where do you want to die, where do you want to be buried after you die? I say, of course, I want to be buried here. My my father was buried here. My grandfather was buried here, and I will be buried here, and my grandchildren will be buried here. This is our land. So the the land then becomes also a repository of, of the of the lineage. It's also it's also almost like an extension of the kin. Mm. It's something personal. And that's such a good point to bring up because often um, land is seen just through its economic value, the resources mm. it can yield, the the what we can use the land for. Yeah. You know, often property or plantations. Um, how then do we ensure that you know sometimes because the legal system, the framework itself, does not recognize the way um, you know indigenous communities look at land and uh, the land that they live on and live with. Um, how do we then address this, particularly in um, situations where the law says that you know logging companies or property development companies or even state governments have a right to, as you mentioned, quote unquote, evict indigenous communities? So, so I'm not sure if it's the law, <laughs> because okay. when they, because the communities do bring. Um, Do bring people who trespass into their land to court, and I see. and and they do win the court cases at least in the you know the first round, right? But there are appeals and and other levels. 
there, there's a whole I, I think but this is just a personal opinion there's a whole cost to 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 the court case but uh, where they do bring to court there are cases that you know I think you can find in the literature where they have won quite often in fact and and the courts do recognize um, you know the, the different court cases like the Adong Tasi and others in the past right. do recognize orang asli claims to customary land it, it does it the courts do recognize the problem right. is with the administration okay. uh, the bureaucracy in in then taking these precedences in the court and then and going out and saying let's register uh, orang asli customary land so selangor had a land council i'm not sure what happened to that and in this in and in, in some years back they claimed uh, and I, I you know i sort of just picked this up as i was looking around they claimed to have uh, gazetted 60% of orang asli customary land um as of last year i don't think that was made public where they gazetted this land so it would be very interesting if the slango government could could you know tell us where are these gazetted lands <laughs> That's and that's could, interesting they could, that they don't make that public, right? Yeah, I, mean, I I I could have been ignorant on this, so okay. yeah, you know I stand corrected, of course. To, uh, if anyone knows where it is, and of course if they've done sixty percent, where's the other forty? Let's continue. Right. Yes, it's it's so such the, a progressive thing. Let's move on with it. Can I? I mean, so can the, I ask you a lot of the 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 conversations around. Um, discussion about eviction or displacement of Orangasli communities and you know uh, uh, take uh, uh, customary land rights um, come with the uh, qualification that oh but we have engaged Orangasli we've spoken to them we've informed them but how do we know Kamal if that is an even playing field if there's no exploitation happening if there is you know um, two equal parties coming together at a negotiating table fairly is that what is happening i i i i wouldn't i, I wouldn't know i wouldn't i'm not party to this sort of meetings but i would assume for a fair meeting to take place you would want to ensure that the orasli have legal representation in this meeting to advise them correctly on their rights and also um on the the, the sort of um you know on, on the sort of of uh, space that they can negotiate or terms yeah. they can negotiate for. So I think legal ad, legal advice for orang asli in arranging this, um, you know, consultations are important. And I think the state and the private sectors who, you know, in this in in some cases they are government linked companies and also you know the state. So I think in these sort of instances, it, it, they they really do have a responsibility. Maybe not a legal one at this point, but but perhaps a moral one. To ensure that the people that they are consulting with understand what they are saying, uh, and can and can and and can respond, you know, on a on a on that as you said, a level playing field. Of course, then there is so, so that goes into this idea of ethic, free prior informed consent. So it's not just getting consent or consultation, but it has to be free and prior. It has they have to understand what they're consenting to. They have to understand what they are agreeing to. Um, and I think that's important. So just talking to somebody is not actually getting informed consent. That's a good point. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Anthropologist Kamal Sahami Fazil, then we're going to take a quick break here and consider this, but we will be back with more. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, you're watching Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Our next guest on the show is Dr. Elias Asadullah. He's a professor of economics at University Malaya, also the co-editor of the International Journal of Educational Development. Nias, um, we understand that you recently um, completed a case study on uh, development and inclusion in the west coast of Slango, uh, focusing on coastal kampongs, uh, particularly in Port Klang. And part of that study included um, Mamari families, and, and I wanted uh, to begin our conversation today by maybe looking a little bit at your initial findings of 
what did you find um, when you looked at the lived realities of Mahameru families, um, particularly in the uh, in the coastal areas in Portland? Thanks, uh, Melissa, for having me on the show. So as you know, uh, coastal kampungs of Tuang Valley have been home to Mahameri people for several centuries. But this part of Malaysia has also seen massive industrial developments in recent decades. Mega projects such as world-class seaports, express highways have created jobs and have also connected previously underdeveloped islands to cities and major business hubs in Tuang Valley. So during my visit, it struck me uh, that despite modernization of coastal districts, uh, Mahameri villages uh, are in some ways similar to what I've seen in rural Sabah. Um, so the majority are below the PLI um, with many in extreme uh, poverty. Livelihood strategies uh, include fishing and other natural resource-based activities such as making broomsticks, uh, beetle pouch, uh, wood carving. Um, lately though, some have taken jobs uh, in plantation sector and also in service sector as cleaners in nearby resorts. But again, when I compared uh, what I saw in B40 Bumbuka families in Kampungs of Pulawinda, for example, Mahamari community ranked very uh, poorly in terms of productive assets and modern household appliances such as television, handphone, and uh, digital gadgets. Right, so, so, so if I can understand this clearer, that even among um, families or households that are on or below the poverty line, Mahameri families actually fall further below, they have um, more extreme poverty, more extreme dep deprivations, is that, is that accurate to say? Yes, so within the B40 community, they, put, they were ranked much lower, be it in terms of income, be it in terms of uh, ownership of uh, productive assets or possession of things that we take for granted uh, in our Plant Valley today. Why, why are they so economically vulnerable? Did you, did, did um, you know, part of your case study, did you look at um, understanding the source of the economic vulnerability? Well, yes, uh, their vulnerability is uh, in a way a story of Malaysia's development paradox. Um, in the course of rapid industrialization, uh, what we have seen uh, in our coastal Klang Valley is marginalization of Rangasi people. As we build new seaports and seaside resorts uh, to facilitate trade and tourism, we have also destroyed forests and nature. And this is exactly you know, what is at the heart of the economic vulnerability issue of you know, Mahamari uh, community. As industrial activities intensified, for instance, in Port Klang and Pulau Inda, forest and marine life in downstream villages of Pulau Kari were adversely affected. And what we don't recognize is that this pattern of development has created an existential challenge for Mahamari families, who are, by the way, also known as uh, forest people or, and sea people. Uh, for them, ecological preservation is more important than economic growth. Uh, but unfortunately, our one-sided pursuit of GDP uh, growth is forcing the Mahamari people to continuously having to adapt to their new environmental reality, as well as also dealing with uh, land displacement by having to give up on traditional occupations. So again, to come back to your question, I see uh, these changes as a form of economic alienation, where efforts to escape poverty are paradoxically making it increasingly difficult for Mahamari people to preserve culture and tradition. And again, to me, this risk of identity loss is an extreme form of vulnerability, something not quite captured in official poverty narratives. Right, and that's a really great point because you know it it, it po capturing poverty in all its different dimensions and deprivations is so difficult, and you add this. Uh, dimension of a marginalized community, indigenous communities, it's also, I think it's important to take that into account, particularly when we have, you know, this official narrative of poverty and poverty reduction 
in the country. Um, yes, you mentioned a bit earlier that looking at some of the extreme poverty uh, of the Mahmeri families that you spoke to, it reminded you of the extreme poverty in, in Sabah. And one of the things that, I, that struck me when you said that was the fact that these families live so close to a high income district. They live so close to, you know, the, 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 the bustling cities of KL and in, in the Klang Valley. Talk to us a little bit about the, this income gap, you know, in highly developed districts like Port Klang and, and how that jives with what you saw on the ground um, talking to Mary families. Melissa, you're absolutely on the spot because we are talking about a part of Klang Valley that has seen you know, leisure, leisure center like Laguna Park are the luxury developments. So therefore the challenge for Mahamari community and other B14 in that part of Malaysia is also to be reminded of the enormous income disparity that exists in Malaysia today. So, uh, you know, um, so again, you know, when I was reflecting on the official narrative, I, you know, I want to know how, uh, Kampung residents in coastal uh, Klangali, including Mahamari people, were relating to this massive uh, modernization effort that was happening in Port Klang and also Pulau India. So there is uh, some uh, good news for the government um, uh, in the sense that when I asked uh, my respondents to comment on whether their life uh, is better today compared to 10 years before, uh, the majority uh, answered positively. So that is kind of an endorsement of the official narrative that uh, economic growth has benefited uh, everyone in Malaysia. It has trickled down to Kampung, uh, including those proximate to Port Klang. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there were also other patterns that emerged from my conversation. And let me highlight two gaps, which uh, are quite, uh, you know, contrast to what we hear from government uh, narrative. The first one is that, uh, the presence of double digit poverty uh, in uh, locations that are so close to these growth hubs, right? So government statistics rarely go below district level. And again, you know, if we reflect on um, the district of Klang or Kuala Langat, these are districts where the median income is very high, monthly medium income close to 8,000 ringgit. And as per government poverty data, poverty is only in the less than 3%. So we don't quite hear about stories of double digit poverty and exclusion in last mile villages in this district. So that's the first uh, you know, gap in official narrative. The second one relates to the changing nature of poverty in coastal kampongs. Again, you know, what the government would tell us is that those living below PLI don't only care about absolute income. They are not concerned about uh, the widening reach for income gap in Klang Valley. I found quite the opposite. Um, you know, based on my conversation, there was this heightened sense of uh, inequality um, among uh, Kampung residents, including Mahamari community, in the form of large perceived income gaps between rural and urban residents of uh, Klang Valley. And it is interesting that, uh, you know, this perception of unequal Klang Valley is uh, stronger among residents who lived closer to Kuala Lumpur and particularly those who had a television. And, uh, you know, to me, these uh, perceptions are important because uh, they are indicating growing concern of positional status, right? That, you know, the distance between the rich and the poor and even among those who are living below PLI. So what it means is that the poor in coastal Klang Valley are not just in absolute poverty, they're also relatively poor. And these perceptions are adding to popular discontent and undermining the spirit of shared prosperity. All right. Yes, uh, in the couple of minutes that we have left, I just want to ask you about, you know, you talked about that the part of the poverty and the deprivations that they face also include the lack of you know, preserving their culture, the loss of identity. As an economist, Nias, how difficult is it to measure um, that as part of measuring poverty? Well, you know, so this is exactly, you know, uh, an issue at the heart of measuring poverty. So as we debate about poverty, so we reduce the lived experience to numbers uh, in terms of headcount measures. So we use statistics where we don't have much room for empathy um, and uh, much uh, space to 
uh, you know, incorporate the lived reality of the poor. And uh, this is in a way uh, doing, you know, uh, a great deal of damage to Malaysia's effort to ed eradicate poverty because uh, let's, uh, you know, be frank, uh, the poverty we have in Malaysia today is last mile poverty. And these are areas where even economic growth has not been sufficient. So where people are in conditions of crap. So where there is this uh, intimate relationship, not just between markets and poverty, but also ecology and environment. And this is where the government has to go beyond uh, poverty statistics and adopt more participatory um, approach, giving the poor direct voice in describing and narrating um, the poverty in which they live. Otherwise, we will continue to sort of leave behind these stories of double-digit poverty, even uh, in uh, places that are very proximate to right. you know, cities such as Kuala Lumpur and Kuala Right. Yes, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Uh, thank you yeah, for shedding some light on this important issue. Economist Professor Nias Asadullah there, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Thank you so much for watching the show and good night.